I want to talk about leadership, particularly in the UK, because there's an issue. Now, in the NHS, it's the UK's largest employer. They have over a million people working for it. And 77% of those people are women. How many do you think are in directorships and above? Give us a percentage. Anyone? Ten? Ten? Well, it's 24%. Now, when it comes to the BAME groups, um, African and Caribbean people in particular, in leadership positions, senior leadership positions in particular, there's 5.7%. When it comes to FTSE 100 boards, it's only 5%, you know? And then when it comes to high-level policy making, there's only one in 16. It's not a lot. My passion is leadership development. And it's an area that I, I think we really, really need to develop. But I'm also a data junkie. And it just adds weight. And it just makes it realize that, you know, there's an issue here, you know? So people talk about the barriers to certain groups, such as women and BAME groups, getting into leadership. Um, and the barriers that I want to concentrate on are two, and that's external and internal barriers. Now, the external barriers are things such as, I don't have any jobs in my area, I wasn't born in this country, I have a foreign-sounding name, and other things like that. But when we look at the external barriers, they can actually be overcome. So you can relocate, you, you know, it doesn't matter where you were born or, or anything like that. With it when it comes to the name, people like Barack Obama and Chuka Umuna, you know, they never let it stop them where, you know, getting where they wanted to get. So that's an external one. But the internal ones are a little bit more hard to shift. You know, things such as, I'm not very confident, I have low self-esteem, I was born on a housing estate, no one's going to listen to me, I'm going to be the only black person or non-white person in the room, I'm going to be the only woman in the room. These are the kind of things I've um, had in my head. But with time, they can be overcome. Now, when we are thinking of leadership and progression, it's easy to think about leadership, and it's easy to be a leader when you let go of your ego, you know? Start thinking like a leader, then you'll become one. If you're not in a leadership position yet, and you want to be, be the best at what you're doing. If you're working in a supermarket, be the best shelf stacker or can labeler you can be. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit when I was doing data entry, I worked in a housing team. Never worked in housing before, but that came up. And I was the best at data entry I could be. And within two years, I worked as a data manager. And it's about, you know, if you're thinking about leadership, because everybody's got the ability to do it, right? When you're thinking about leadership, if you want to do it, you can. There's nothing that can stop you, really. That internal block, people are not going to listen to me, or people aren't going to like who I am, is it really their problem or is it yours? You know? So, when it comes to leadership, think about how you can influence. We've all got the ability to do that. The moment we're born, we've got the ability to influence. Look at babies. They're so cute, aren't they? Right? Yeah. They just have to open their mouths, go, wah! And everyone's like, oh, baby, we know they're cute, they're small. That's the only way they can communicate with us, OK? We can do the same, except we don't have to cry about it, right? Something happens when they get to their teenage years. Something happens when they get to adulthood. They stop, because people are constantly saying, be quiet, don't say anything, 
you know, you'll upset that person, th this person. Sometimes we have to do that in order to get up there. When we look at people like Nans Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, these people dared to stand up and put their head above the parapet, you know, and they dared to be different. And that's where I'm coming from. You know, I like to do things a little bit unconventionally. So I'm going to take you back a few years to when I was about seven years old in primary school. I was labelled as slow, and I was quite shy, although some people who know me would say, really, you, shy? I was quiet, shy. My, one of my school reports, the first one said, she has problems. And a lot of the time, when I was younger, we moved around a lot. We were homeless at one stage. I had terrible eczema. I had really goofy teeth. I was often the new girl in school. I had to make friends. There was times when I'd make friends and I'd move, or we'd move. We never knew why. And I was overwhelmed at being in a huge school where I didn't know anyone. So most of my lunchtime was spent standing by the door, just watching everyone else play, you know? And I lacked so much confidence, I didn't open my mouth a lot of the times. Fast forward to early 80s, when I went to secondary school. The message I got growing up in Hackney was, you're not going to amount to much. I rebelled a little bit. Um, after an exchange with one of my form teachers, you know, she, she said to me one day, or she asked me, do you want to be known as Grace or as a disgrace? I didn't answer that. I thought, mm-hmm. My careers teacher, on telling her that I wanted to be a mechanic, said to me, Grace, that's a really dirty job. You don't want to do that. Think about something else. Okay, so I did. I, so I went back the next time and said to her, I'd like to be a social worker so that I can help children who, like me, needed help. She said to me, but Grace, you're not very good at writing, are you? There's a job up the road in the local takeaway shop. Why don't you go and look there? Needless to say, some years on, I left school with nothing. But now, I have a degree in Communication Studies and Music, BA Honours, and I also have a Master of Science. And by the way, I did learn mechanics and became a social worker. So, you know, one in the eye for you, miss. <laughs> so, fast forward on a few more years to the age of 18, in the mid to late 80s, I got in with a, a wrong crowd. Um, I had ambition, but I really didn't know what to do with it. And got in with a, a street crowd. And in Hackney, there were so many of them. And my mum, who was a major influence in my life, her and one of my teachers, saw a trip going to the Caribbean. And they said, you're going on it. I had no choice. I was petrified, I'd never flown before, I was going to stay with people I didn't know. But it really, really changed my life. So I went over to the Caribbean at 18 years old without my family, and I learned to work with other teenagers who were from the Caribbean, they were from the US, they were from different parts of the UK, and I learned to work with them. I learned to speak publicly there. I learned to speak in a way where I could debate safely and without fighting or using my fists, you know? And what really, really changed my life when I was in the Caribbean is seeing people who looked like me, whose families or parents were bankers, lawyers, doctors, teachers, they had, you know, high-level jobs. Back in Hackney at the time, as a, as a teen, we didn't really see people who looked like us who had those kind of jobs. So 
a lot of us used to think, oh, that's far away from where we can ever get to, you know? So the school I went to still exists, but now my son goes there, and he is having a far better experience than I did, and anyone like me ever did. At the age of 11, he was a diversity leader in his school, and he shared the stage with the shadow attorney general and human rights activist, talking about diversity in IT. And I was so proud because this boy at the time was 11 years old, and he stood and he talked with such confidence. And I said to him, are you nervous? Nah, I'm all right. If you ask me if I was nervous coming here, yeah. <laughs> Even at the age of 50, absolutely nervous. So he's done that. He's 13 now, and I'll tell you something, he is much more confident than I was at 13 years old. And what the wonderful thing that his school does, and many schools do, they work with um, children on leadership, and that's what we need to do more of, you know? When it comes to leadership and thinking like a leader, it's not sitting in an office over the Thames saying, bow to me, minions, do as I say. It's not about that. It's about much more than that. It's about developing people, developing yourself, getting rid of that ego, you know? And I've done leadership positions for 20 years, and, you know, I work with people on leadership, you know? So let's move on to my box. And the reason why I developed this box is because you hear a lot of people saying, think outside the box, or people want to put you in a box. And I decided, I don't want to be in a box. And my box defines who I am. A feminist Buddhist with a passion for keeping it simple, martial arts, shoes. Yeah, I'm a feminist and I love shoes. I was going to wear the red ones, and I thought, no, I'll wear the black ones, you know? And, and this box defines, it can, you know, it defines who I am. It makes me get up in the morning. It really, really does. It makes me get up in the morning. It makes me realize, you know, this is, this is me, actually. This is who I am. I'm really happy with who I am, you know? I have done leadership for many years, and I've worked in many different sectors. I've worked in the music industry. I'm a teacher. I'm a trainer, I've worked in the public sector, the voluntary sector, I've worked in education, I've worked in early years, and apart from music and education, I've had no formal training in the others, but I've been fortunate enough to be able to go into an organisation and be given the opportunity to lead. Someone will say, would you like to have a go at this project? I'm like, yeah, I'll have a go at that and I'll do the best I can do. And that's all you can do. When it comes to being a leader, what I say to people is, if you want to do it, organize something in your community. The first thing I organized, which was absolutely huge, was my mum's funeral. Now, my mum was one of the pioneers of stay and plays, or mother and toddler groups in our area and she was very well known. She was the longest serving lollipop lady in one of the schools. And when it came to her funeral, it was huge. It was like a, a state funeral. But I look back and I think, my God, I organized that. And it was a baptism of fire because what I realized is there's always going to be somebody who does not like what you do. There's always going to be somebody who complains. But at the age of 23, you know, that was really, really hard to deal with. But I knew I could organize something. I knew that I could bring people together. And I carried on with that, you know? And there's been times in my leadership career where I've made huge mistakes. But I always knew I could get it right sometime. I've never really been afraid to put my head above the parapet. I've put my head above the parapet sometimes, got it shot at, but not really shot at people but metaphorically shot at. Um, but what we have to do is just keep going. And the more we think like leaders, the more we'll become them, having a vision, 
that is bigger than your own. It's about helping people and yourself become the best you can be. Now, my desire, my passion is to help people to discover, grow, lead and inspire. So I talked about my box and all of the things it had on it. It's got Buddhism on there because, as I said before, we chant Namyo Ho Renge Kyo, and it's about me doing my human revolution and helping others who need or want to go on their human revolution. The Taekwondo part of my box is about indomitable spirit, perseverance, courtesy, self-control. The feminism box, part of my box is me working in collaboration with men. It's not about disliking men. My son is the closest male I have in my life, and I have to support him, and he supports me. And we're a team. And it's not only about working in collaboration with men, it's about working in collaboration with women, and co working in collaboration for the greater good of your community, or you know, what you're working towards. The simplicity part of my box, you know, I'm also a little bit lazy, but I like to do things in a way that is simple so that I can think easily about things and move forward. When you start to complicate things, things get hard. With leadership, it's not hard. Get rid of your ego. You can create your box or a list or whatever it is that defines you, you know, if it helps. Think about the things that make you get up every day and say, yeah, I can and I will do whatever it is I want to do. That trip to the Caribbean that I had, which helped me to say, I can and I will, you know, it took a lot of years, but it made me think, do you know what? I've got something really, really positive and important to give society and the world. Now, thinking like, oh, I've got something positive to give the world, it's not... You know, it, it's not a bad thing to think, oh, you know, I, I can do something in the world. I've got a purpose. Everyone in this audience has a purpose, you know? So your box, your list, being outside your box, you can have a box like mine if you want to, but be the best you can be. Thank you. <laughs>